Mr. Murphy asked me to keep his introduction brief, which I am happy to do because I am not a public speaker, but he has so much that I would love to talk about. The key points are about his um, purpose and the mission of Sharp Healthcare itself. And it is an organization that really is focused on the uh, satisfaction and the enjoyment of employees, physicians, uh, and of course patients. And that is a, a very valuable perspective. And you'll, I think, hear that as we talk about the Sharp experience. The uh, other key thing that I would note about Sharp is what a large system it is and how comprehensive it is in terms of the scope of the services it provides. So it's got a number of hospitals, it's got skilled nursing facilities, home health hospice, and a health plan. So it really is that integrated delivery network that we hear much of. Uh, Mr. Murphy is also a, a member of the board of the, uh, he's been the chairman of the board for the uh, Ch Chamber of Commerce for San Diego's uh, regional area, and he's been involved in many, many community activities. But here to talk to us about SHARP and that CEO perspective, please give a warm welcome to Mr. Mike Murphy. Well, like all the other speakers have said, I don't want to be between you and the keynote speaker, but I guess I'm the keynote speaker, so I can't say that. But good morning, and thank you for having me here, and thank you for uh, inviting me to be here today and share a little with you. Let me start by thanking all of you who are in this field, whether it's as a consultant or whether it's a CIO or in the hospitals. Thank you for all that you do, because we all recognize that nothing happens in healthcare anymore, and maybe never, but certainly uh, today, nothing happens in healthcare without the input of information technology and the great people who uh, help us try to be the best that we can be. I would like to call out uh, our team at Sharp Healthcare. Uh, I've been very blessed and had a great team. One of the people I was sitting with was saying, maybe we have the longest tenured CIO uh, at Sharp, but uh, Bill Spooner and for his leadership and his whole team, Bill's been with Sharp for 35 years. We have a great team and I'm sure you guys all have great teams, but I'd like to call out the people at Sharp Healthcare for all that they do. Thank you, Bill. When I uh, put the write-up together, and I don't know exactly where it went, I gave Scott a little quote to the write-up, which is an ancient Chinese proverb, or uh, actually more referred to as a curse, may you live in interesting times. And I've used that little curse a lot of times over my career in healthcare, um, and uh, it's been interesting times, but it's never been as interesting a time as we live in today. Um, and uh, I'm going to share with you a little bit more from uh, not the technology perspective, but from the business perspective over the next 45 minutes or so about what's impacting us and how, at least at Sharp, we're thinking about that. And I'll try and bring in some other things uh, that others in the industry are thinking. Uh, but it's certainly interesting times. After spending the last two plus hours in the car going back and forth between sports radio and uh, other radio, um, anything on other radio or news stations was all about Obamacare and the hearings today with uh, Sibelius is tomorrow, the Travener uh, was sitting in the hot seat today. It is certainly interesting times uh, in what's going on in, Sharp Health, in healthcare in general. Let me start by uh, giving you a little bit of background on Sharp Healthcare and who we are, just so you have a perspective of who we are. We're a not-for-profit healthcare system in San Diego. Uh, Sharp's grown from one hospital in 1955 to a full integrated delivery system today where we have affiliated and aligned integrated medical groups. We have two of those I'll talk about just very briefly in a minute. Fully integrated information technology, so our information technology platform runs everything, whether it's our health plan, skilled nursing facilities, home health, hospice, you name it. It's fully integrated and across the system. We have centralized system support services and human resources. We are the largest healthcare system in San Diego. We provide about 29% of the discharges. Um, if you want to measure it on an inpatient side, we have four acute care hospitals, three specialty hospitals, two affiliated medical groups. We were talking about those before. One is a foundation model it's called Sharp Reese Staley Medical Group. It has about 480 multi-specialty physicians. In that medical group, uh, they take fully global capitated payments, and I'll talk about our belief in population health in just a minute. 
Uh, they've been part of Sharp since 1985, they've been in existence since 1920. Um, we also have an IPA, Sharp Community Medical Group, which has over 900 physicians in it, and over 140,000 global capitated lives in it. Um, they've been in existence since 1991. We also have a health plan, which we formed in 1991, um, that sells commercial HMO product. It is a health plan in the California Exchange. We're one of the six products offered in San Diego. Um, and we pretty much do anything there is to do in healthcare. We are San Diego's largest employer with 16,000 employees, 2,600 physicians on the medical staff, um, and about 1,100 of our physicians are in the two medical groups. So we have a lot of physicians who aren't in our organized groups also. So we're very much a community-based hospital and need to uh, treat all of our providers as customers and make sure that they're enjoying their experience with Sharp uh, from a physician standpoint. Um, I didn't keep up with my slides, did I? I didn't. You guys got to catch me on that and tell me, like, come on. Um, so you've, see, you've heard all of that. You haven't seen it all. Um, we have about uh, 2,100 licensed bed, as I said, 1,150 physicians in our organized medical groups, about $2.8 billion next year. Uh, we just passed our budget. As I mentioned before, we are a little different than many that we've believed in population health for a long time. We've been in global capitation since 1985. And we never went away from global capitation. Matter of fact, at one point, those left-hand boxes, that 40,000 senior enrollees, 250,000 commercial enrollees, are enrollees that we take full global capitation for today. So about 290,000 uh, patients that we take global capitation for today. Three years ago, that number was 330,000. And that's a change in the marketplace where people are going to PPOs, high deductibles, more uh, shifting to the individual consumer and getting out of managed care. That's kind of stabilized in the last little bit. It also was impacted when the drug benefit was passed on Medicare Advantage. A lot of seniors said, well, gee, I don't need to be in Medicare Advantage anymore because I have a pharmacy benefit, so I'll get out of Medicare Advantage. But we still have over 50% of seniors in San Diego are in a Medicare Advantage kind of product. So we today have senior enrollees through Medicare Advantage of about 40,000 members, 250,000 commercial members. We do have our own health plan, but only 70,000, we only have 70,000. It's a relatively small health plan. We have 70,000 commercial members in our health plan, um, and that's we only sell on the commercial market. We do not sell a Medi-Cal or a Medicare product. So the rest of those uh, capitated lives are all from other insurance companies that we work with, whether it's Anthem, Blue Shield, Cigna, um, all the other health plans. Anybody who's selling a capitated product, we welcome capitation. We would like to have capitation. Our medical groups and us believe it is the right way to align uh, the total equation to deliver on the triple aim, which we've been doing for many, many years, and we welcome it. You'll see that the, model, the market has changed, and we've decided to play in the market as it changes, even though we uh, have ex experienced certain growing pains because you'll see when we talk about ACOs, if you've seen one ACO, you've seen one ACO, and they do change. But we have been in the commercial ACO market for three years now. We started two, three years ago with Aetna. Uh, two years ago, we added Anthem. Uh, we've just added a new product with uh, Aetna. So we have three commercial ACO products and 20,000 attributed lives in the commercial world. And we are a pioneer ACO with 32,000 commercial, uh, excuse me, 32,000 senior lives attributed to us. There were 32 originally, there are 23 remaining. We are one of the 23 remaining, and uh, maybe if we get enough time in Q&A, you can talk to me about that. We still do believe it's the right way to deliver high-quality, cost-effective health care. It's got a lot of bumps in the road, uh, but I would say that on all of the ACOs. As I move forward, let me talk about the challenges we all face, unrelated to any of the interesting times we're having but a little bit even uh, reflecting on a comment that was made uh, by a senator as I was driving up this morning and he said uh, by some miracle he thinks all of this mess will blow up and we'll go back to our old good system. I bring this up partially to remind us all that the old good system was broke. The old good system before the Affordable Care Act, Medicare was bankrupt in 2017. The old good system could not go on without change. The old good system was changing, in his mind, old good system, and I'm pointing out that I'm not necessarily a fan of the ACA or the old, but the reality is we have a problem collectively as a country. 
We have a debt and deficit problem. We all just lived through the second time we had to raise the debt ceiling. Uh, we all know that the argument there is how big can the deficit be every single year. The deficit's lower this year than it's been in a number of years. It's only $700 billion um, this year. Um, and uh, we're trying to fight our way through that. The U.S. health care costs are 23 percent of the federal budget, and on average across the states, they're 21 percent of the state budgets. If you haven't looked, our state fixed itself by taxing us a little bit more, at least fixed itself temporarily. But there are many, many states that are in big time financial trouble. Um, our state included, if you would ever add in the retiree health benefits or the retiree benefits that are not paid for at all or funded. But in our state, we kind of ignore that for now. The average annual family premium of four is 15,000. This was two, a year and a half ago, $15,745. That's a problem. From 2012 to 2020, it's estimated health care spending is projected to double without changes. That was a year ago's projection. Medicare lives are at 48 million, growing by 10,000 baby boomers a day, every day for the next 10 years. This is one of the real problems with the federal deficit. We cover everybody over 65, and everybody is aging in. Um, to this population and we are going to have such a balloon here that that's what's costing the money. The actual inflation is as low as it's ever been in the cost of how healthcare is going up. It's that we're paying for a whole lot, whole lot more people and you'll see in a minute we have a little, whole lot less people paying in. Medicaid lives are at 62 million but because of the Affordable Care Act they were supposed to grow by 16 million uh, beginning in 2014. But you might remember the Supreme Court said not all states had to pass Medicaid on. So that number has actually been now, uh, given that 26 states aren't going to put it in, that number's down to about an $8 million, $8 million additional Medicaid. And the federal government was real nice. They said they'd pay for all that for the first three years. But after that, 10% of it goes to the states. That's why those 26 states don't want to do it, because they don't want to pay 10% three years from now. And they also don't believe the federal government will pay all of the 100%. Now, California did pass it. Um, this is one that not everybody remembers, and I know even my own parents and others who are now currently on Medicare, they all think, well, we paid in, so we deserve it, and we covered it, we paid for ours. Today, the average couple receives $387,000 in Medicare benefits, and they paid in $122,000. This was never funded actuarially. It was funded based on current workers funding past retirees, and as you see just below that, when we started in 1965, there were four, work, four workers paying in for every beneficiary. There are currently uh, less than three, and in 2040, there will be less than two. That's because the baby boomers are aging in. We have a whole lot more beneficiaries, a whole lot less workers. The math doesn't work. Um, that's why it was going to be bankrupt in 2017. Because of the ACA, it's bankrupt in 2024. So it did, that point right there, we did extend it, but even if we get through all these rocky roads of right now, we are still going to need to make significant changes because the Medicare Trust Fund is still bankrupt in 2024. We all just lived through the government, federal government shutdown uh, January 15th. We need to raise the debt ceiling again. Um, and we need a new continuing resolution to move forward. They formed a special committee that's meeting. Uh, of I think it's about 12 members of Congress and, the, and uh, they are meeting to, right now. Uh, remember the last time we did this we got sequestration. Most people think sequestration only impacted defense or other programs. I'm sure you are all aware that uh, the day sequestration hit There are known knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. But there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. <laughs> Excuse me, but is this an unknown unknown? Uh, I'm not. Several unknowns, and I'm, I just want I'm to not this going, is an unknown I'm not going to say which it is. I'll say there are a lot of unknown unknowns, um, including after the drive up today. Um, and obviously, I, I put that in there partly to get a laugh, because I'm not a very funny guy. And um, that succeeded, so I'll check that box. 
But it does describe, now he was obviously describing something very different, but I certainly believe it as aptly describes our current environment as any quote I've ever seen, and, and as honestly, the, we don't know, um, as much as even my board would love me to tell them, how is this going to work? How is the exchange going to work? Are we happy we're in the exchange? Uh, Why would we do any of that stuff? Why are we in the Pioneer ACO? There are a lot of unknown unknowns, and they're playing themselves out, and we're going to have to play them out. Now, I would say, on our side, uh, at least at Sharp, we think we need to be part of the solution. And that's why we do a lot of the things we do, is because we know the system can't go back to what that senator said this morning, the old good system. There is no old good system. We can't afford the old good system. We collectively need to figure it out. And we in the healthcare industry are probably better prepared than anybody, uh, and even us don't really know exactly. So let me go briefly into healthcare reform and how it's impacting all of us and, and thinking about it uh, impacting your businesses. This bill was passed in March of 2010. Everybody, particularly outside of healthcare, thinks all of a sudden this is just happening to all of us now. It's impacted all of us since really March of 2010. Our payments were reduced. We got to insure our dependents up to age 26 almost immediately. Um, there were a lot of things that have been happening since March of 2010. I'd point out that the bill that passed was not a bill that anybody wanted. Remember, it passed on Christmas Eve in 2009 by one vote. Then Ted Kennedy died. The president knew he could never get another vote and actually have it pass in the Senate. So they used the reconciliation process which meant they couldn't change the bill, because neither the Senate or the House wanted this bill. Um, and that's part of what they're arguing about. I was listening coming up. They're arguing about the definition of grandfathered plans, and grandfathered plans wasn't defined well because we did this reconciliation bill. But it wasn't a bill anybody wanted, but it was the only bill that would actually pass after Senator Brown got elected in Massachusetts. So they did the reconciliation process and lived with the bill that passed uh, the Senate on December 24th, 2009. Um, it is mostly a bill that uh, actually accomplishes insurance reform and access reform. I don't know that it really delivered on what they call the triple aim, which was better care, better health care uh, of populations, and lower growth in the cost curve. Uh, as I said, it primarily was able to accomplish insurance reform, uh, which is actually the biggest thing that's happening right now with all the noise. There were pieces of insurance reform that happened before. But the biggest pieces are happening right now, where you have the essential benefit plans and the insurance companies can't sell the old products that didn't meet the essential benefit coverage. All of that's what's happening right now, um, although insurance reform has also happened over the last three years. And they reduced costs. Now, they reduced costs primarily by taking it from providers. And we've been living with that, but we're going to live a whole lot more with that over these next several years. And that's part of the unknown unknowns. How are we going to deal with that? How are we going to make that uh, reality? The bill was 2,700 pages, and uh, the famous quote, Nancy Pelosi, you know, we got to pass it so we can read it and understand it. It actually was a pretty straightforward bill, and they flowcharted it, and we can all understand it quite easily. This is our new healthcare system. Um, again, I put this in partially for humor, um, but uh, it, because it is funny. Um, uh, it's a little bit sad because actually you could take this picture before the Affordable Care Act, and there'd probably be about 13 or 14 bubbles that would come off that chart, but that was our healthcare system before the Affordable Care Act. There's about 13 or 14 new bubbles on that chart now with CMMI is on there, the PCOB is on there, the, uh, uh, the IPAP is on there. So there's new things that are on there, many of which they're trying to undo right now. IPAP is trying to be taken out. Uh, there was a device tax for uh, uh, healthcare manufacturers they're trying to take that out now. So they're, they've been changing this bill since it actually passed. Uh, and it is a very complex system. My main point is, though, that it was a complex system before we had the Affordable Care Act. Very quickly on numbers, because I know you've probably heard this. These are the numbers that came out in March of 2010 by the CBO. The bill was supposed to cost $940 billion. Uh, we've seen all kinds of estimates since then. I actually am not showing this really to kind of get into the cost. I'm showing it to see what did we accomplish and how did we pay for it? The first thing we t accomplished is under spending increases, we covered 32, or the bill was supposed to cover 32 million people out of the 48 million uninsured people. They were supposed to cover them in two ways. One was expand Medicaid. That was the 16 million people I talked about before. 
So anybody who made up to 133% of the poverty level would be covered under Medicaid. Prior to the act, it was up to 100%. So everybody between that 100 and 133, or sometimes it's referred to as 138, uh, January 1, they get a Medicaid card. That was going to cost $434 billion over 10 years, cover 16 million people. Secondarily, where's the individual mandate? We're going to cover 16 million more people by making them buy insurance or they would be required to pay a fine. If you made less than 400% of the poverty level, you would be subsidized. So you wouldn't have to pay all the cost of your insurance. You would be subsidized. Now that's, so now everybody below 133 is covered by Medicaid. 133 to 400 would be covered under a subsidy and be mandated to buy. We all know the... Um, Supreme Court heard the individual mandate and actually decided it was legal because it was a tax, which was it was, but it wasn't called a tax in the bill, but it was a tax, is what the Supreme Court said. So it was mandated. To everybody's surprise, the Supreme Court actually ruled that you couldn't mandate Medicaid expansion, and I already touched on that. So 26 states are still not moving forward with Medicaid expansion. So how are we going to pay for those two big line items of costs? Well, $455 billion comes out of providers. It's been coming out of our tails since April of 2010. They started collecting money for three years before the bill actually uh, becomes became impacting that uh, coverage expansion. So we've been all having our payments reduced. 130, out of that 455, 113 billion comes out of hospitals directly. 132 billion comes out of Medicare Advantage, so that means it's coming out of physicians, hospitals, pharmaceutical companies, everybody along the way. And 36 billion comes out of disproportionate share funding. That is just beginning to impact us October 1 on the provider side. Just to put it in perspective for Sharp Healthcare, um, the first year of the Medicare uh, after this was passed in 2010, we had our payments reduced about three and a half million dollars. The second year was seven and a half million dollars. The third year, it was $12 million. And October 1st, we had our payments reduced $27 million. With the theory being, we don't need all that money anymore because all of these people will be insured come January 1. So they'll be insured so we don't need the disproportionate share funding, we don't need the Medicare funding. They enrolled six people on day one in the country. Um, so all this in people who are going to be insured January 1 is an unknown unknown um, uh, that we're all uh, dealing with. But the payment reductions have actually happened. The biggest one that actually is kind of very sad, but is reality. Remember I said in 26 states, they didn't expand Medicaid. Well, part of the reason they were taking away the Medicaid dish was because we're going to expand all these Medicaid patients so you won't need them. Well, 26 states didn't expand Medicaid, but they're still losing their dish payments. So from a hospital perspective, if you're in a state that didn't expand Medicaid, you're losing the money and you're not, there's no way you're getting any more beneficiaries because they're still going to be uninsured, which is a double whammy and clearly pressure for those states to turn around and say, behave, cover Medicaid. Um, and some of those states are actually trying to do it. Ohio's now trying to do it. Anybody making over $200,000 a year, you're, you paid an additional Medicare tax since 2010. Your Medicare taxes have gone up. Anybody who has interest in dividend income that uh, made over 200 grand, those are all taxed with a Medicare tax now. They never were taxed with a Medicare tax before. Taxes on insurers, there's pen there were penalties, but I'll get to that in a minute. That got put off a year. It was supposed to start um, October 1 or January 1 of this year, but large employers got their penalties put off. Um, drug manufacturers have a tax, $80 billion over 10 years, and device sales manufacturers have a tax, $80 billion over 10 years, although that's the one that's actually got a lot of traction to actually be overturned uh, as soon as we solve our budget problem. Um, then very quickly, uh, it was going to cover 32 million more Americans, and because of this bill, as I said several times already, it extended the Medicare Trust Fund an additional nine years to 2024. That's actually been increased now because the Medicare spending has been coming in lower to now it's 2025. They think the Medicare Trust Fund will last till. I covered already the expansion, how they were going to expand it. Medicaid was going to be expanded by 16 million in California. That means 2 million more are eligible for Medicaid beginning January 1. That actually is still the law. 
Uh, you have seen that much of the news about the expansion happening on the exchanges is most of the people who are signing up for expansion are Medicaid beneficiaries. Uh, that's true in California also. There is, are some problems with the Medicaid expansion that we're concerned about in California. Still less than 50% of the physicians in California will take a Medi-Cal patient. So they'll have a card, but will they have some place to go? Um, uh, and they probably still will be using the emergency room for their primary care provider. Part of this is to get people a medical home and find a provider, but if the payments aren't sufficient for the physicians to take care of the patients in the appropriate setting, then they can't get in there, and then they'll go to other settings. Virtually no urgent care centers would take a Medicaid patient today. Um, community clinics obviously will, but, but uh, an urgent care center that's privately owned does not take Medicaid in almost all instances. Um, so it is a challenge and that expansion will happen January 1 with a lot of people getting a new card and thinking they're covered, but will they have providers to actually cover them? As I mentioned, it's up to the eligibility is up to 138% of the poverty level. And as I mentioned, the federal government pays 100% of this expansion for the first three years and then somehow we're gonna figure out how they only pay 10, 90% of it and the states will pick up the rest. Um, insurance reform on the right side, 16 million people covered through new insurance programs where they're mandated to buy insurance or pay a fine that is 1% of their income or $95, whichever is more. When an insurance policy is going to cost somewhere between, on the low end, say a bronze product, $3,000, and you're going to pay a fine of 1% of your income or $95, there's a lot of question of how many will actually <clears throat> buy on the ex exchange. Individual subsidies, anybody making below 400% of the poverty level, you'll be subsidized. I'll show you what that means in a minute. That's actually paid for through the plan. Um, that is what will happen, particularly, and it's happening, and you're hearing a lot about it. Anybody who is ill and making below 400% of the poverty level, trust me, they're shining up for the exchange. They're going to find a product. If you're young and healthy, you're going to be evaluating, is it a $95 fine? Is it a $200 fine? Do I really want to pay whatever the policy is? Um, I will say in these new products, there are huge out-of-pocket costs that people are just starting to figure out as they start to shop for them. In the employer side, there was not an employer mandate. It was that if you didn't, if you were an employer with more than 50 employees and you did not provide coverage to your employees that met the essential benefit plan, then you paid a $2,000 fine per employee. That was supposed to go in January 1. That was supposed to raise $90 billion over 10 years in fines. That has been put off till January 1 of next year. So that's one of the changes that has been made in the last four or five months. Um, and uh, that probably will continue to be fought by large employers. Uh, but you also have this dynamic where some large employers are saying, well, $2,000 fine, or I'll just tell you at Sharp, we pay about $9,000 for every covered beneficiary. $2,000 fine, $9,000 premium. Um, you have heard some large employers who have suggested they'll just turn it back to uh, their employees and tell them to go to the exchange. Don't know that that will happen. There have been some interesting things that have happened. Um, UPS has stopped covering all dependents. Um, so they've stopped covering any dependent that has insurance available to them through another employer. So they dropped by 16,000. Um, Walgreens has moved all of their employees to a private exchange and just given them money and saying, good luck, we're out of this. You buy it off the private exchange. So there's a lot of activity as to how this will actually unfold. One of the things you're hearing a lot about is that uh, health information exchange, that's what that HIE means on this one, is the, uh, the exchange, not the IT kind of exchange. This is the shopping exchange with the health, essential health benefit plans. In the Affordable Care Act, they defined the health, essential health benefits. They said what needed to be in the packages. And a lot of what you're hearing about the hue and cry right now is these are pretty reasonably, pretty good packages covering lots of things, sometimes covering things that individuals didn't even want. Um, like some uh, in previous individual policies, you didn't have to buy maternity coverage. In an in a, a essential health benefit package, you have to provide uh, maternity coverage, even if you're not of age, you're paying in theory for that. And that's one of the reasons you're seeing some of the costs go up when people move from their individual policy to the exchange, and you're hearing a lot more about that. This exchange was established, um, and we all as the providers were supposed to negotiate rates with all of the health plans. Obviously, we did okay negotiating rates with our own health plan. 
Um, we were able to come to rates with one other health plan, um, but um, a lot of it's still kind of unknown as to who are the networks in these exchanges and who are the providers in the 13. There's actually 12 products in, San, in California, six in San Diego, and we do not have rates with all of those, and we'll see kind of what happens when they get coverage in January, how we get paid if they end up in our hospitals. Um, in the actuarial val values of the plans, Remember I said the essential benefit plans. In the healthcare exchange, one of the things not everybody understands is every one of the health plans and the benefits that the people are buying is exactly the same health plan. The essential benefit plan is the plan. You're buying it either in a platinum, gold, silver, or bronze level, but you have the same benefits. The difference is how much your out-of-pocket cost is, who your network of providers are, but it's the exact same benefit plan, and what are your out-of-pocket costs? So you see the different bronze, the silver, the bronze, the silver, the gold, and the platinum. The reality is what it's been defined as, and actuaries needed to test this when you submitted your plans as an insurance company, that on average, if they purchase a platinum plan, the out-of-pocket cost to the average platinum member when they need health insurance will be a 10% cost to them. So their deductibles and coinsurance are pretty low. The out-of-pocket costs at a bronze level plan are 40%. So if you buy the bronze level plan, you'll pay a lot less, but you'll have a whole lot more exposure if you, lose, if you use the plan. Your deductibles are gonna be higher, your coinsurance is gonna be higher. And some of these are capped out as an individual at 60, most of them are capped out at individual out-of-pocket costs of $6,800, family out-of-pocket costs of $13,000, which are more expensive than traditional insurance policies. The policy itself is the same policy in all of those plans. It's the same essential benefit package. It's just priced differently. It's priced differently by who's in the network. And actually, all of us are waiting to see, come January 1, who actually are in all of these networks. We know which networks we're in. We don't know who's in all of the other networks. That's one of the problems that's been on the California exchange. They have not been able to bring up the provider networks with the products. Um, so when you're buying a product on the California, covered California exchange today, you buy a product and you might know, you'll know the price point. It's actually working better than the federal exchange, but you don't know whether your provider's in that product or not today. Um, in theory, you will sometime soon, but that hasn't been brought up yet. So what does it mean in Cover California from an income level? Just kind of at that chart there that's going to test my own eyes here. Um, everybody below this 133 to 138% of the poverty level is on Medicaid. If you're a family of one, that 138% of the poverty level is 15,000. Family of two, it's 21,000. Family of three is 26,000. Family of four, it's 32,000. So anybody in that bottom category, you get Medicaid automatically come January 1, you register, you prove it, um, you will be uh, in there. Anybody making 138 to 200, you're gonna get most of your product subsidized by the federal government. You'll go to the exchange and you'll pick either the silver or the bronze product. The silver and the bronze, silver is the subsidized product. You can pick the lower product, but you can't pick a higher product. The silver product still says you're responsible for 30% of the out-of-pocket cost. So it is insurance, but remember, these are people making below 138% of the poverty level. They do get subsidized premium, and they actually do get some of their subsidized out-of-pocket costs. As you move up, the out-of-pocket costs don't get subsidized. But you can see that partially, all the way up to 400% of the poverty level, you are eligible for subsidies. As a single individual, that's $45,000. As a family of four, that's $94,000. So all people in those categories could go on the exchange and will be eligible for a subsidy at varying levels based on their overall income. Other things that happen in the Affordable Care Act that do impact you on the CIO side and impact all of us and probably you've all been working on them was this value-based purchasing. They didn't change to totally away from a fee-for-service model, which based on what I said earlier about our desire and thoughts that, uh, that population health is the way to go, fee-for-service is not the way to go. But the Affordable Care Act didn't do a lot to fee-for-service. We're still all getting paid fee-for-service. We now have penalties built in that they called value-based purchasing. 
and we're now needing to track all kinds of things around value-based purchasing. I'm not saying these are bad things. These are good things. We should be enhancing our quality. You'll see by t in 2014, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, that from a hospital standpoint, we had in 13, 1% of our Medicare payments at risk if we didn't perform in the top quartile. In 2014, it's 1.25, and it builds to 2% in 2017. In 2013, it was measured by process of care measures or core measures. You guys are probably all familiar with those, with the Joint Commission core measures. How do we perform on the core measures compared to other hospitals? And the second, 30% of our results were based on patient experience. How did we perform on HCAPs? That's measured against every hospital in the country. And if you top, perform in the top quartile, you get all your money, you keep all your money. If you perform below that, you lose some of your money. Sharp Healthcare lost about a half a million dollars in year one. One percent of our Medicare money is about three and a half to four million dollars a year. So these are serious when you see that it's going from one to 1.25 to 1.50 to 1.75. And you actually see that in year four, year 2014, they've added outcome measures. So now there's three mortality measures on three specific outcomes of disease. There'll be a fourth next year. And in year four, 2015, they're adding total cost of care. Total cost of care measured by three days post-admission, excuse me, three days pre-admission, 30 days post-admission. So Medicare is going to put all those costs together and say, if you perform in the top quartile, you get to keep your money. If you perform in, uh, excuse, in the bottom quartile, you lose the money. Top quartile, you keep the money. Middle 50, you lose some money. So this is motivating all of us to look across the whole continuum about how we are providing care in our hospitals, now in our in patients' homes, making sure that they have the drugs that we prescribe, making sure that they're following up on their appointments, because if they don't, it's money out of our pockets if we're not performing where we need to be. Uh, I know our IT people are tracking all of this and spending on believable times uh, trying to put all of this together and help us see it on an ongoing basis so we can manage it in real time. Quality-based payment reductions, we probably also heard. In addition, there's a was a 1% penalty in 13, 2%, 3% going in 15 through 16 uh, is related to readmission rates. If your readmission rates are in the bottom quartile, you lose that sum of money. That's a lot of money. Now remember, that's kind of saying to you, the hospital, one, you need to do the right thing so they don't get discharged too soon. But it's now putting a great deal of responsibility on you for the 30, first 30 days of their home. Better make sure they do what they need to do to not be readmitted because it is all cause readmission. They might have had a heart attack. We treated them for a heart attack. They went home and fell down the stairs. That's counted against us. So how do we make sure that we're doing everything we can to ensure that our patients are doing what they need to be doing at home? They're adding uh, hospital-acquired condition penalties in 2015. Those are things like falls in the hospital, retained sponges, wrong site surgeries, all good things, all things that we need to be working on. But if you look at that, that says that in 2014, 3.5% of our Medicare reimbursement. It's not just on those little measures. It's not just on the one or two or 20 patients you measure, if you're in that bottom quartile, every dollar Medicare paid you, you're subject to 3% withhold. And that will build to 6% in 2017. Still paid fee for service, but incenting us to look at quality and look at the whole episode of care. Quickly on the uh, ACOs, uh, just to tell you a little about them. If you've seen one ACO, you've seen one ACO. The only one that's actually very well defined, and you could look at it across the country and say they're the same, is the Medicare ACO. Uh, ACO was originally kind of formulated by Elliot Fisher in 2006 when he started talking about ACOs and having responsibility for care across an entire continuum with a group of providers. And again, from a population health standpoint, when we're capitated, we totally feel we have that responsibility across the total continuum. But when you're being paid fee for service, and trying to get that into an accountable care organization, it's a challenge. That middle bullet there shows you Medicare's definition from the Pioneer ACO. It's an organization of healthcare providers that agrees to be accountable for quality, cost, and overall care for Medicare beneficiaries who are on a fee-for-service model. So these patients haven't decided they want to be in a coordinated care model. They've been attributed to us, and we 
as the Pioneer ACOs, or if you're in a fee-for-service, a, a shared savings ACO, you need to help them engage in their care and be the most cost efficient, uh, which is not necessarily aligned with the individual's desire. The individual, if they desired that, probably would have gone into Medicare Advantage. But they've stayed in Medicare fee-for-service so that they can have choice. Every quarter, the federal government sends every one of the Medicare beneficiaries a letter that says, you're in a Medicare ACO, they'll do great things to manage your care, but by the way, it's a Medicare ACO, you don't have to do what your physician tells you. You can go to another physician for a second opinion. You can go to another provider. Um, and the, there are drastic differences in utilization between the ACO population and our Medicare Advantage population. And I'm doing that speech tomorrow for another group. Um, on the commercial side, the commercial side's still trying to figure this out. Um, and the commercial side's doing a better job with building in incentives that if you go outside a network, it's going to cost you more. So there are incentives built in to have the traditional PPO patient say, well, wait a minute, maybe I will stay in network for this. They're working better, but they're still moving all over the place. And, they, and, when, and that's where I really say, if you've seen one ACO, you've seen one ACO. Our Aetna ACO in year one was different than our Aetna ACO in year two. Our Anthem ACO was originally a primary care medical home model. In year two, they decided, oh, we're only going to do chronic care management. So now we only have chronic care patients attributed to us rather than all patients. And that's going to evolve as people see, are these ACOs really going to be able to bend the cost curve? There's still a lot of questions out there about them. The goal under an ACO, uh, this is Medicare, is to uh, really go back to the triple aim, better care for individuals, better health for populations, lower growth in Medicare expenditures. Our ACO, this is our pioneer ACO, um, our aim is to best health, best care, best experience. We talk about uh, all of those. We talked about all of those long before the Affordable Care Act. We, what we actually saw when we went into the ACOs is how can we take what we know from managing 300,000 people on a capitated basis and the things that we've already put in place from information technology to chronic care management, how could we take those and move them to a fee-for-service population and engage those patients better to bend the cost curve? That's really our goal in why we have entered into these ACOs. And that's really what we uh, have emulated and have been doing, which is different than many people who got into this because we had all that infrastructure in the managed care side of our business. We're taking that same infrastructure and moving it to our ACO, whether it's a pioneer or whether it's the commercial side. We didn't, on the commercial side or in a fee-for-service ACO, we didn't manage chronic care patients the exact same way we did in a capitated world. First off, because we knew in a capitated world they were chronic care. In a fee-for-service world, they come to us for an episode. But now that we're in a pioneer, pioneer uh, ACO, we got three years' worth of claims data. When we got three years' worth of claims data, we scrubbed that data through our data warehouse and our IT folks, and we said, these people are obviously chronic care patients. So we've now got them in our chronic care teams, and we're trying to manage them uh, in a better way. We've had some success, but I guess I would have mentioned it many times already. A lot of those patients don't want to be managed. So when we reach out and say, it's pretty obvious, you know, you've been to the cardiologist at Scripps four times, us six times over the last, we want to get you into our congestive heart failure uh, group. A lot of them say, well, I don't really want to get into that group. So a lot of that will kind of ferret its way out. I think a lot of that you saw when nine of the Pioneer ACOs dropped out and said they would go to shared savings or drop out altogether. Uh, we still think it's worth our uh, effort. I would tell you it's worth our effort is a little bit different than many others because we're not investing in new things. We didn't hire a new team for chronic for congestive heart failure or pulmonary failure or diabetes management or Coumadin clinic. Those all existed for our 300,000 managed care patients. So we may have added another person to manage these 32,000 patients, but we didn't start from scratch. So we haven't invested what many other people have invested. This committee structure really is describing our pioneer ACO, but it's no different for all. And it was, it's not anything different other than the governing board from our managed care model. The governing board was required out of the law from the pioneer ACO. We had to form a separate company, had to form a separate board, and had to have two community members on the board. But all those other teams are what we do today to manage our care in our 300,000 managed care lives. So they're the exact same teams doing what I said before. 
these are the kinds of things that we have implemented, and this is what we uh, had the patients we think we will touch l the current year that we're in out of our 32,000 beneficiaries uh, that we'll have touched that would not have been touched theoretically under a Medicare fee for service model. That they would have come and had an episode of care, but we wouldn't have uh, touched these patients in all of these different ways. It is bending the cost curve. We did lower the cost curve uh, last year, but we did not lower it by 2%. You got to get more than 2% to actually get a check from the federal government. So we did bend the cost curve, but we were not one of the, it was four or six that actually received a payment. Um, and we were not one of the four or so that actually had to write a check to the federal government either. So we did continue in the program. Kinds of investments related to what we do in the population health management. And again, all of these were being done before the ACA. All of them were being done before the accountable care organizations. Is we, Cerner run, is our hospital system. Allscripts is our ambulatory system. We are implementing today Crimson, Medventive, and uh, that, that is working with both our medical groups and our health plans. We've had a data warehouse uh, probably, how long, Bill? 85? Which is when we started population health management, um, and that it continues. We have a very successful home-built patient portal, but we're actually looking now as how do we move that patient portal and what is the best way to get it across the entire system, particularly more into the inpatient world. Uh, DB Motion is our own health information exchange uh, product, and then all the care management tools. We invest a lot in people, in care management teams, call centers. We've had a nurse triage line and call center. I've been at Sharp 23 years, 24 years, and it was there before I got there. Um, and we've had all of that. We have six urgent care, seven, excuse me, five in one medical group, four in the other, nine urgent care centers. So we are out in the community looking at the continuum of care across the entire continuum. We do manage out of network if one of our capitated patients or now a, a patient in our Pioneer ACO gets out of our system, we are very actively trying to get them back into our system because that's where the care will be managed the best, that's the physician that knows them, and that's the way we can manage their total episode of care. So we have a whole group we call the out of network team and those are nurses that are in all the other hospitals in San Diego looking for patients that are attributed to us either in the managed care world or in the ACO world, the full risk world, and those process measures. Last one I will touch on before I get to a few strategies and tactics and then close is just more of a challenge to all of us, which makes it very challenging to you, is just quickly to go through all the different, now I'm on the medical group side, out of the hospital side, there are financial ramifications to our medical groups for not meeting their quality standards. And we, as I'm sure you guys all feel more than I do, keep getting inundated with everybody measuring quality differently. So if you look at this graph, you have the Medicare Pioneer ACO, they have 33 quality metrics. The Medicare fee-for-service PQRS reporting, if you don't report it, you have 1% of your payment withheld. They have different recording measures. Our ACOs, particularly the uh, commercial ACOs, have different quality measures in each one of them, despite the fact we tell them Gee, can't we land on common quality measures? Our commercial HMO, or P for P, for all of the managed care lives in California, they have their quality measures. And then Medicare Advantage, which if you're in a Medicare Advantage product, they have the five star, four star, three star, they have their quality measures. And just quickly to show you, they're all different. You're all tracking them all. We're all asking you to track them all. We're asking you to track them real time so that we can keep on top of them. These are the five star measures. We can all argue, and our physicians do, uh, whether they're meaningful measures or not meaningful measures, and do they really bend the cost curve or what, uh, and some do, and clearly some don't, and periodically they make a change to them. These are the 33 Pioneer ACO measures. You might, I know that's quick, but you might look back. They're both Medicare populations. They are measuring different things in many cases, um, and, and they do impact payment. Both of those two that I just mentioned, if you're a five-star, you get the most payment in your open enrollment. In the Pioneer ACO, if you hit all 33 quality measures, you get all your money if you save money. But if you don't, you lose money. In PQRS, if you don't report all of these, you lose 1 and now 2% of your Medicare money. This is all physician money that I'm talking about right now. None of it's hospital money. Um, and these are PQRS continuing. And this is the P for P. 
Um, and this is big money to our medical groups. If you perform on the pay for performance, uh, they get millions of dollars. If you don't, uh, you don't get that money. All good things, but all complicated and complex in how we track and complicating your lives. Quickly, I will go through some strategies and tactics that we're using at Sharp uh, to combat the known and the unknown and to operate in an environment where I said uh, we need to navigate through the system, we need to be nimble, and we need to be quick. This is taken uh, somewhat from our strategic plan, somewhat I stole from the advisory board, and somewhat I stole from a good article that I read from Kaufman Hall. Um, but from our standpoint, make a compelling product to all stakeholders. And actually, in my introduction, when we say all stakeholders, we mean all stakeholders. It's got to be a compelling product for our own employees and our employees to work in. They've got to feel about the purpose, the worthwhile work, and what we're doing and how we're making a difference. It's got to be the same for our physicians who are practicing in our system, and we need to communicate that. And they need to know we're making a difference for their patients. And clearly, if we do both of those, we have a shot at making a difference for our patients and their families, and they'll feel that difference, and they'll choose Sharp Healthcare. Reduce the cost of care, uh, increase the quality of care. And clearly, all of the things that I just talked about in moving to an ACO or what we do in managed care or chronic care management teams is all aimed at enhancing quality, reducing cost. Eliminate variation in care. IT certainly plays a role in every one of these, but in variation of care, the Medventive, the Crimson, the predictive modeling, all the products that we're looking at is how do we eliminate variation of care, unnecessary care, duplicate care, unwarranted care, make sure that all the physicians are practicing uh, in the right manner. Right size services at all uh, sites. I think we all in the healthcare industry need to do a better job of that. We're not all going to be able to be all things to all people in all places if you don't have the volume to be there or you don't have the expertise to do it there. And I think you're starting to see more of that, although we're going to need to see a lot more of that. Implement uh, top of license patient care. Um, this one is a tough one, and actually it's tougher than it probably should be. I'll probably get booed if I have some physicians in the room. But there were several bills passed this year to have nurse practitioners be able to practice more at the top of their license. That was opposed by the CMA, didn't happen. Um, the reality is we've got to get physicians practicing at the top of their license, nurse practitioners and PAs practicing at the top of their license, pharmacists practicing at the top of their license if we're going to take care of all of these uh, patients that are theoretically going to have a card come uh, January 1 and uh, make sure that that is coordinated across the continuum, that people are supervised correctly, but we need everybody at the top of the license. Use purchasing practices that maximize value for everyone. We're going to need to partner more with suppliers and purchasers. We've actually historically been, how do we get the lowest price? If you sell to us at the lowest price, you'll be our vendor. We've got to do a lot more about how we're partnering with, purchaser, uh, with uh, suppliers and bringing the cost down. Standardized practices across clinics and ambulatory sites of care that gets back to variation um, and actually expands to now. We on the healthcare side cannot just, and us, we haven't just been an integrated system. We've been out in the sites with our Sharp Community Medical Group and Sharpie Steely Medical Group. But even community physicians now are engaged in all of this, and if they're going to be successful, they're going to have to manage across the continuum. They're going to have to be connected with a healthcare provider. They're going to have to have IT systems, and they're not all doing it today. Use scale to gain efficiency and competency. Um, and this is really aimed at you are going to see more and more hospital organizations getting bigger. You're going to see more and more physicians going into medical groups. In California, since we can't employ them, they won't be directly employed. But you're seeing physicians, community physicians, because of what I just said before, saying, I need to be in a bigger group because I can't do this on my own in my hospital in my own medical group, so they're either joining medical groups or aligning with healthcare systems. You're seeing hospitals align. I will say uh, in the advisory board's point of this, it says use scale to gain efficiency and competency, not leverage, um, because there's a whole lot of talk every time a healthcare system joins another healthcare system. They're only doing it to leverage the payers. I took that off because I didn't want it attributed to me, so I'll deny I ever said it. Um, but clearly, there's a whole lot of attention across the country that as healthcare systems get bigger, are they getting bigger really to be more efficient? Or are they getting bigger to say no to payers and be able to demand a higher price? Or is there a lot of both of that going on? There's probably a lot of both of that going on. 
eliminate unnecessary tests and procedures, address the cost and quality of care at the end of life. One of the places we spend far more money in this country at end of life care than any country in the world. And in reality, we don't have much better outcomes. And I would challenge many of us, and I know this is a hard one because I've had it with my own family, um, but I'm not sure we deliver quality life for those last several months sometimes either. So we're going to need to grapple with that, but that almost killed the Affordable Care Act, maybe it should have, when you got into the death panels. And, and there was nothing ever written in the Affordable Care Act other than a physician should get paid $40 to have end of, an end-of-life conversation with a patient to consult with them about what are they thinking they would like to have happen at the end of their life. That was a death panel. Um, the reality is those conversations have to happen, and they really have to happen when they're healthy, not when they're sitting there and somebody else is answering for them. Um, and the reality is we're going to have to figure that out. We still don't believe, we believe fee-for-service is part of the problem, and um, I could show you that in our Pioneer ACO in spades when we see where other claims are getting paid, what skilled nursing utilization is like, what home health utilization is like. When you're paid fee-for-service, you do things. When you're paid to manage care across the continuum, um, you do things. They're not exactly the same things. Um, we do believe we need to innovate. We need to be flexible. We have not figured it out. As I said before, we need to be part of the solution. I'm going to close with a very short little video now that I've depressed you and told you all of the challenges. I want to close with that we do need to be part of the solution. Uh, I th actually was heard Scott talk about the introduction and at Sharp we talk about what a great purpose, worthwhile work and the ability we have to make a difference. What a great field we are in healthcare. Uh, the things that we are able to do for patients, families, employees. I can't imagine being in any other business that you have the ability to impact that and we need to in our organizations, in our minds say what is the right model and how can we make this better. Um, it's certainly got all kinds of bumps in the road right now, um, but I think we need to be challenged and we need to move our organizations forward to create the best system we can under the Affordable Care Act, to adjust the Affordable Care Act to whatever needs to be adjusted to make a better system, um, and to figure out how we're going to have a healthcare system that serves us all well. And I'm going to give us all a little pep talk, as, and then I'll open up for questions if there's time. I think we all need pep talk. The world needs you to stop being boring. Yeah, you. Boring is easy. Everybody can be boring, but you're good at that. Life is not a game, people. Life isn't a cereal either. Well, it is a cereal. And if life is a game, aren't we all on the same team? I mean, really, right? I'm on your team, be on my team. This is life, people. You got air coming through your nose. You got heartbeat. That means it's time to do something. A poem. Two roads diverged in the woods, and I took the road less traveled. It hurt, man! Really bad. Rocks, forms, and glass. My pants broke. Wah! Not cool, Robert Frost. But what if there were really were two paths? I won't be in the one that leads to awesome. It's like that dude Journey said, don't stop believing, unless you dream stupid. Then you should get a better dream. I think that's how it goes. Get a better dream and keep going. Keep going, keep going, and keep going. What did Michael Jordan have quit? Well, he did quit. No, he retired. Yeah, yes, he retired. But before that, in high school, what if he quit when he didn't make the team? He would have never made Space Jam. And I love Space Jam. What will be your Space Jam? What will you create will make the world awesome? Nothing if you keep sitting there. That's why I'm talking to you today. This is your time. This is my time. It's our time. We can make every day better for each other. But if we're all on the same team, let's start acting like it. We got work to do. We can cry about it or we can dance about it. We were made to be awesome. Let's get out there! I don't know everything, I'm just a kid. But I do know this. It's everybody's duty to give the world a reason to dance. So get to it. You just been pet.
TED Talk. Create something that will make the world awesome. Play ball. Thank you for having me here. I know I took most of my time, but we have a few minutes.